right, now, we're going to do something slightly different. I've invited Mark onto stage. And you know, give him a hand, help him out, help him out. He needs uh, all the encouragement that he can get. <laughs> because every time I do this, I know I'm going to regret it down the line. But in any case, so we made sure we didn't give him a mic this time. That's at least his safety in that. So when you, when you go to the movies, there's, there's a music score, all right? And you're watching the mu movie, but there's music going on in the background. And what does that do? It sets the tone, sets the mood a little bit. And so I've asked him to come in, and I want to tell you a story this morning. But I need a little bit of mood going with that as well. And, and so we, we're going to try it already, sounds nice, Mark. Just, just keep going, just keep flowing. Give him a hand, give him a hand. Not too much, not too much, just a little bit. All right. So I want to tell you the story of Esther. We're going to look at the book of Esther this, this morning. It's, it's quite a unique book. It's one of only two books in the Bible named after a woman. All right. Now, before the ladies get excited, it's also one of only two books in the Bible that never mention God. How did that happen? As, as odd as that is, there's a reason it's in the Bible. And, and I'm telling you, there's such great uh, 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 lessons in this little book. I say little book because it's only got 10 chapters. And so we're going to look at that quickly this morning. And just I just want to highlight one of the lessons. There are many lessons in this story, but I want to highlight the one. Uh, just something else that's just interesting when you look at the book. Do you know they say the book of Esther is the best historically attested book in the Bible? In the entire Bible. Meaning that there are historical documents, uh, other than biblical documents, historical uh, uh, documents that uh, support uh, the, all the facts and support the story in the, in the book of Esther. Now, the book of Esther is written during the Jewish exile. So the entire story plays out outside of the promised land in a, in a place called Babylon, which is basically today's Iraq. Uh, Babylon was situated about 70, 80 k south of, of Baghdad. So just so that you've got an, an, an idea of where that was. Uh, th there are four main characters in this story. And so let me introduce you to these characters. The first character is King Xerxes. Very powerful king, ruled over a very, very large, very powerful area, spanned all the way from India in the east, all the way through to Ethiopia and, 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 uh, and Egypt in the west. That, that whole area had 127 different provinces with, with obviously 127 different governors. And so they faced a little bit of a threat from the Greeks. And so he got all these governors together to hold a conference to discuss how they were going to handle this, this uh, potential threat. And so after the conference, he held a banquet for them. And this is where they drank a little bit too much, had a really good time, the banquet. And then he asks for his wife, Queen Vasti, to come in and to dance for them. She refuses. And so she's, she's not going to dance. Now, you can't really blame her. Because, you know, who wants to come and dance in front of uh, a whole lot of drunk men? And so she, she refuses to come in and dance. And so, of course, this puts him in a very precarious situation. If he lets this slide, I mean, all his noblemen, his governors, his officials, they're all watching to see how he handles it. And if he lets this slide, it could set a precedent in, in, in the whole nation and and they are saying to him, our wives and other wives could treat us in a very similar way. We've got to deal with this thing. And so they suggest that they banish the queen. And she would never, ever come into his presence again. And so that's what he does. The queen is, is, is banished. And for a while, it's kind of okay. And he, he handles that. And then he becomes lonely. And so his advisors come to him again. They say, why don't we have a beauty pageant? And the winner of this pageant would become 
your, your, your wife. He thinks that's a brilliant idea. So they get the most beautiful woman throughout the nation, get them together. And this is where Esther actually wins this thing. Uh, now Esther is, is actually an orphan girl. She lost both her parents, but she was uh, raised by her, her, her cousin, not her uncle, her cousin Mordecai. And so Mordecai raises her but he warns her. He says, don't tell anybody of, uh, 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 that you're a Jew. Don't tell anybody of our relationship because there was a very strong anti-Semitic sentiment at the time. And so there she is, and she's become the new queen, but nobody knows she's a, she's a Jew. Now, that brings us to the next uh, uh, figure, uh, and, and this guy's name is Haman. Now... Haman was a baddie. Yes, dramatic music. I like that. Give us dramatic music. And so he's a baddie. He's the prime minister. Very powerful, very wealthy man, but he hates the Jews. So you can imagine there's tension. You can just sense the tension. Give us tension. <laughs> All right. And so you've got the king, this very powerful king who's married this beautiful, beautiful girl who's a Jewish and he doesn't even know it. You've got Haman, who's the prime minister who hates the Jews. And then you've got Mordecai, a Jewish man. And so he's very concerned for Esther. And so he visits the palace courtyard every day. He kind of sneaks in just to find out if, if Esther's doing all right, if everything was, was great there. And so one day when Mordecai was walking uh, past the, the city gate, he stops there and people would typically congregate around the city gate and chat and so on. And so he stops, he chats to a couple of people and he overhears two of the king's bodyguards busy with a, with a plot to kill the king. And so he realizes he has trouble. So he rushes quickly to Esther to go and tell her Esther then goes, rushes back to, to the king, tells the king about it. They investigate this whole story, find out it's true. And these two guys are impaled on wooden stakes. It was their custom at the time. They would plant these sharpened poles in the ground and impale these bodies on there and leave them there for people to see. That's what happens. It's, it's almost like crucifixion. It's a very public thing. It would scare off people. Now, then there's a dramatic turn of events. Yeah, that's good, that's good. Where Haman goes to the king, and he convinces the king that they should kill off all the Jews. And you think, well, where did that come from? I, I know he hated the Jews, but how, how do you do that? Well, you see, what was happening is he would walk through the city, and wherever Haman went, remember he's the prime minister, People would bow down. They would show tremendous respect. Everybody would do that, except Mordecai. Mordecai absolutely refused. Now, that was stupid because we're supposed to honor people in, in, in authority, and he just refused to do that. And so uh, Haman burnt with anger, not just anger toward Mordecai, but toward the entire Jewish population. He was just mad. And so he goes to the king, and he convinces the king, we need to, we need to just destroy them. Because these guys are misfits. They have a different religion. They even have different laws. They have a completely different custom. We need to get rid of them. And the king agrees upon this. And the Bible says they cast lots to decide when this would happen, when they would murder all the, all the Jews. And the lot fell on the 13th of the month. So that's where that whole superstition around the 13th started, by the way. When the Jews heard this, you can imagine, they were terrified. And so Mordecai instantly sends a messenger to, to uh, 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 Queen Esther to tell her to please go to the king. Please go and speak to the king. Uh, and he reminds her, he says, the reason you're in power now is for a time such as this. And so that's that very well-known verse that we know in, in chapter 4, verse 14. It's a time such as, as this. You, know, you raise me up. I like that. I like that. <laughs> and so she says to, to Mordecai, she says, there's no ways I can go. 
you dare not go to the king uninvited. If you do, you'll be killed. So he has a royal scepter when he's sitting on his throne. And if somebody had to walk in and he doesn't raise the scepter, if he raised the scepter, it meant he accepted that person's presence. If he didn't raise the scepter, he wouldn't have to do anything or say anything. The gods would grab that person and they would die. That's how serious it was. And he reminds uh, uh, Mordecai that she hadn't been to the king. She hadn't been invited for about a month, 30 days. She hadn't been there. But she also realizes she has no choice, really. She's got to go. And so she asks Mordecai to get all the Jews together and to fast and pray for three days. And she would do that together with her, her servants. They would fast and pray. And on the third day, she decided to go in into the king's uh, uh, presence and face whatever may come. But she knew she had to do this. And so she went in trembling. When the king saw her, man, he was so happy to see her. He was like Esther. You know, he hadn't seen her for 30 days. You know, let's. So Esther, come in, come in. And he holds out his scepter. And she comes forward, kisses it, bows down and everything. And he says, what can I do for you? What, you know, obviously she wants something. You know, he figured that out, you know. What, can, what do you want? And he says this to her. Ask whatever you want. Even if it's half my kingdom, I'll give it to you. And so she's just, she's bowled over. She doesn't actually know what to say. And so she's standing there. She, she doesn't know how to say it. And so she says to him, I, I, I want to invite you to a banquet tonight. Uh, and, then, and then I'll tell you. Okay, no problem. And, and, and bring Haman, your prime minister, to this banquet as well. Go and tell Haman we've got a banquet tonight. And, and, and he must change his plans. Whatever he's got, we've got a banquet with the, with the queen tonight. And so that's exactly what happened. Well, that night, I'm telling you, she whined and dined them. And the three were just having a great time. It was just lovely. And so, um, yeah, that's nice. So they're just having a great time. And so the king says to her, he says, hey, what can I do for you? You've got something on your mind. He says, now, come on, tell me now. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm quite curious to know what it is. And, and so again, she's standing there and, and she can't find the words. And, and she's so nervous and and so she says to him, um, uh, I'll, uh, come to a banquet tomorrow night. Yeah, I'll, I'll tell you, I'll tell you tomorrow night. He's probably thinking the school is nuts or something, but, but okay, okay, then we'll come. To, and bring Haman with tomorrow night. And so she's buying a little bit of time. She's gaining a little bit of confidence, but this is what they do. And so Haman goes home that night. I'm telling you, now he's on top of the world, you know. He's so excited. I like that. And uh, man, he's walking around, you know, he's the prime minister. He's arrived. He's the only one to go and dine with the king and the queen and everything. And he walks past the city gate and there's that dirty old Jew who refuses to get, a, get up and to, to respect him again. And he cannot believe it. And he's mad. He's angry with this guy, Mordecai. But he decides, you know what? I'll let this slide. I don't have time for this nonsense. And he goes home. And the Bible says he tells his friends, his family, his neighbors, everything. You know, he's arrived. And, 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 and you know, all of this. And he's dined with the king and the queen. And you won't believe it. They invited me tomorrow night again. He's got to go back. And then, then he remembers this old dirty Jew. And he tells his wife, he says, you won't believe it. I just walked by. And he refuses to show any respect. And so she comes with advice. She says, why don't you erect the tallest pole, the tallest stake that you can find. And tomorrow morning, you go in and you ask the king to impale him on that stake. That's exactly what, Mord, uh, what Haman did. He went and he found a 75-foot stake, 20 meters high, and had that dropped into the, into the ground. He was ready for Haman that next day. 
That same evening, the king can't sleep. He's tossing and turning, and he just, he can't sleep. And so eventually, in the early hours of the morning, he asks some of his servants to go and get some of the historical journals. You see, it was their custom to journal everything because to them it, it was the history and so every day they would journal stuff whatever happened and so he says go and get some of those journals and bring them read them to me you know and he's thinking if something is going to put me to sleep tonight it's that and so they come out with that and they happened to pick the one where the two gods were planning the assassination attempt and they start reading that and while they're reading it they tell how Mordecai was the guy who had exposed this whole thing. The king never knew that. Nobody had ever told him at the, in the past. It was, there was so much other stuff happening. Now he hears it. It was Mordecai. And so he says, he says, what did we do to reward that man? Oh, nothing. Nothing. What did he ask for? Nothing. What was the reason? What was his motive? seems like to save you sir so he says we got to do something we got to reward this guy well just then Haman comes to work early because you see he's got a big request to put into the king and so he walks in and the king says hey come over here man I need your advice he says you know what do you suggest I do for a man whom I really want to honor wow you know, Haman's mind starts working overtime because he's thinking, who would the king possibly want to honor more than me? And so he says, he says, well, you know, now think about it. Why don't you take your royal robe and place it on this person and then put that person on the king's own horse? The biggest, the fastest one, the Ferrari one. Put him on that horse. And then let one of your top officials, not just anybody, not just a servant, one of the top officials, lead that horse through the streets and call out, shout out to everybody. This is what the king does if he wants to honor a person. And the king says, this is a brilliant idea. I like that. That's, that's great. He says, you said a top official? He says, well, I've got the top official in front of me. Why don't you go and do that to Mordecai? He can't believe what he's hearing. And so Haman has got to go out there, take Mordecai, put the robe on him, put him on the horse, and lead him through the streets. And so that's exactly what he did. He's just, he, he can't believe how, how wrong this thing has gone. That night, he went to the banquet. But this time, he's not excited. He's just, he's down. He's subdued. He realizes things have gone wrong for him. These plans that he's had to get rid of Mordecai and to get rid of the Jews, this, this whole thing has, has turned. And, and so he doesn't know how to handle it. He's still busy sitting there during this banquet. His mind is somewhere else. The king asks the queen, Esther, he says, Esther, what is it you want? And he repeats it again a third time. He says to her, even if it's half my kingdom, I'll give it to you. I mean, that's the kind of favor she had. This, he really loved her. He says, what is it that, that you want? And so she says to him, she says, there's somebody trying to take my life and the life of all of my people. And he looks at her, he's like, what are you talking about? And then she reveals she's a Jew. And she was raised by Mordecai, the very man you honored this morning, the very man that saved your life, is the man that saved my life, and the man that raised me. And now this snake sitting at our table is wanting to take our lives. The king is mad. The king jumps up. He thinks before he does something, before he acts, he needs to just take a walk outside in the garden and just go and, just go and cool down, just, just think properly. 
while he's out in the palace garden just, just cooling down, Esther reclines on one of the couches waiting for the king to return. Haman knows his time has come. This whole thing has gone so wrong that the Bible says he basically throws himself on Esther, pleading for mercy. And as he's doing this, the king walks in. And the king is like, what on earth are you doing? Right here in my palace, you want to get fresh with the queen? What do you think this is? <laughs> and so the guards grab him, drag him off. And while they've, they've, uh, they take him away, one of the guards says to the king, he says, by the way, there's a 75-foot pole erected for Mordecai. The king is, What? I'll tell you what, go and impale his body on that pole. And he's put on that very same pole that he erected for, for Mordecai. That same day, all of Haman's property was taken, given to Esther. She put Mordecai in charge of that entire estate. Man, that was... He's playing Abba. Money, money, money. Mark, we church. You see, I'm already regretting this. Okay, it was fitting. I'll give you that. And so, all of the property is handed over. And the king promotes Mordecai. And he becomes one of the officials. And the Bible says his fame spread right throughout the, the, the nation. And he became more and more uh, powerful until eventually the king promoted him to prime minister. That's how, how well this guy did. And he served the king for many, many years. Now, what does that have to do with us today? A lot. Because you see, this story is not just an interesting piece of history, but it's a reminder that you and I too have a king who's on our side and who's concerned for us. And it doesn't matter what we're busy going through at the moment, what we're facing, what enemies we have, people coming against the circumstances that are unfair. God sees those things, and God can take those things and turn them around and make good come out of it. Because that's what Scripture says in Romans 8 verse 28. Have a look at it on the screen. We know that in all things God works for the good of those who love Him. All things, all things. And so I've shared this with you today to build your faith. That's it. Just to build your faith. Because where there is no faith in the future, there's no power in the present. If you don't have faith and confidence in God, you're not going to handle your current situation well. You're not going to be the best you can be now. You're not going to make good decisions. And so many people do that. They get, they get so caught up with a problem. They get so focused on that. And all they can do is talk about it and think about it and stress about it and worry about it and talk about it. And they get so focused on that that they forget God. Where there is no faith in the future, there's no power in the present. And we're not going to make good decisions. And you may be saying, but Leonard, I don't know if I have faith. Oh, you do. You do. You've just got to put it in the right place. Because when you drive off this property this morning, you're not even going to think about it really. But as you leave the gate, you're going to turn that steering wheel. What are you doing? You have faith that that whole mechanism working right through onto the wheels is going to turn your vehicle. Then you approach the traffic light and you don't even think about it. You apply brakes having faith that those brakes are going to work. Or oh, you have faith. If you had to go on holiday and suddenly you become fairly ill on holiday, what do you do? You quickly go and see a doctor. Somebody you don't even know. And you may not even be able to pronounce their surname. <laughs> And then that doctor diagnoses you with some kind of con condition that you don't quite understand. And then he writes out a script 
which you can't even read, and you go and hand it in at a pharmacy that you don't know, you've never been there, and they give you medicines and stuff that you don't understand or know, or, but you take it. <laughs> Why? Because you have faith in that. We all have faith. It just depends where you place it. And so I'm asking you this morning to put your faith and your confidence in God, to put it completely in God and to trust God to turn your situation around. You see, so often in, in, in difficult times, we want to try and understand. We, we want to have knowledge. And so, you know, we look at what we're going through and we're saying, why? How is God going to use this? Where is this thing going to turn around? And where is this thing going to take me? And what are we trying to do? We want understanding. We want knowledge. I'm asking you today, never try and exchange faith for understanding. Never do that. Faith is far more precious. It's far more important. Because if you had understanding, you knew exactly you wouldn't need faith. And if you don't have faith, God can't work in your life anymore. Because the Bible says the just shall live by faith. And he's saying, my children, that's how I want them to live. Not by understanding, not by, with knowledge. I want them to live by faith. Hebrews 11 says, without faith, impossible to please God so many times in the New Testament we read Jesus commending people for their faith and saying to them things like your faith has made you well according to your faith it'll be unto you <laughs> I wonder how much we've missed out on simply because maybe we didn't have faith we didn't put our faith and our confidence in God because we were so focused on this enemy, so focused on this problem, instead of just putting our confidence in God. And so I want to ask you this morning, what are you facing right now that's causing a little bit of concern in your life? What is scaring you or stressing you? What is the enemy using against you? Because I want to ask you, bring that to Jesus. Jesus himself said in Matthew 11, come to me, come to me. It's an invitation. All you who are weary and burdened, in other words, stressed out, come to me. And he says, and I will give you rest. And I just want to encourage you this morning to do exactly that. Just to come to him and to say, Lord, this, this situation, God, this person, give it to him. And say, I don't know how you're going to do it. But frankly, that doesn't matter. Because there's a promise. You will cause all things to work together for my good. And so if that's your prayer this morning, I want to invite you to stand. And we're going to pray that together. You are our God and our King, but you're also our Heavenly Father. And you love us and you care for us and you want the best for us. And when things go wrong in our lives and we don't quite understand, you somehow, somehow, and I don't know how you do it, but you are God. You take that and you flip it around and you make good come out of it. And so we come to you this morning with faith, with confidence. And we say, Lord, we bring this situation to you. Mention it to him now. Whether it's finances or health or business or marriage or relationship, it doesn't matter. 
God, we've brought it to you. Because you're bigger than any of this. And we just needed to hear this story this morning. Because the God of Esther is still the God of today. You are the same yesterday, today, and forever. You are faithful. And so thank you, Lord, that we can come and put our trust and our confidence in you today. And everyone said, Amen. Let's give God a hand. Come on. Thank you, Lord. We just praise your name this morning. Give you honor and glory. Amen. Amen. Have a great week, man.